Forward. For as long as we've been talking about services, we've been talking about data. In fact, before we even had the word microservices in our lexicon, back when it was just good old-fashioned service-oriented architecture, we were talking about data, how to access it, where it lives, who owns it. Data is all important, vital for the continued success of our business, but has also been seen as a massive constraint in how we design and evolve our systems. My own journey into microservices began with work I was doing to help organizations ship software more quickly. This meant a lot of time was spent on things like cycle time analysis, build pipeline design, test automation, and infrastructure automation. The advent of the cloud was a huge boon to the work we were doing, as the improved automation made us even more productive. But I kept hitting some fundamental issues. All too often, the software wasn't designed in a way that made it easy to ship. And data was at the heart of the problem. Back then, the most common pattern I saw for service-based systems was sharing a database among multiple services. The rationale was simple, the data I need is already in this other database, and accessing a database is easy, so I'll just reach in and grab what I need. This may allow for fast development of a new service, but over time it becomes a major constraint. As I expanded upon in my book, Building Microservices, a shared database CRE is a huge coupling point in your architecture. It becomes difficult to understand what changes can be made to a schema shared by multiple services. David Parnas once showed us back in 1971 that the secret to creating software whose parts could be changed independently was to hide information between modules. But at a swoop, exposing a schema to multiple services prohibits our ability to independently evolve our code bases. As the needs and expectations of software changed, IT organizations changed with them. The shift from siloed IT toward business or product-aligned teams helped improve the customer focus of those teams. This shift often happened in concert with the move to improve the autonomy of those teams, allowing them to develop new ideas, implement them, and then ship them, all while reducing the need for coordination with other parts of the organization. But highly couplet architectures require heavy coordination between systems and the teams that maintain them. They are the enemy of any organization that wants to optimize autonomy. Amazon spotted this many years ago. It wanted to improve team autonomy to allow the company to evolve and ship software more quickly. To this end, Amazon created small, independent teams who would own the whole life cycle of delivery. Steve Yege, after leaving Amazon for Google, attempted to capture what it was that made those teams work so well in his infamous, in some circles, platform rant. In it, he outlined the mandate from Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos regarding how teams should work together and how they should design systems. These points in particular resonate for me. One, all teams will henceforth expose their data and functionality through service interfaces. Two, teams must communicate with each other through these interfaces. Three, there will be no other form of interprocess communication allowed, no direct linking, no direct reads of another team's data store, no shared memory model, no backdoors whatsoever. The only communication allowed is via service interface calls over the network. In my own way, I came to the realization that how we store and share data is key to ensuring we develop loosely coupled architectures. Well-defined interfaces are key, as is hiding information. If we need to store data in a database, that database should be part of a service, and not accessed directly by other services. A well-defined interface should guide when and how that data is accessed and manipulated. Much of my time over the past several years has been taken up with pushing this idea. But while people increasingly get it, challenges remain. The reality is that services do need to work together and do sometimes need to share data. How do you do that effectively? How do you ensure that this is done in a way that is sympathetic to your application's latency and load conditions? What happens when one service needs a lot of information from another? Enter streams of events, specifically the kinds of streams that technology like Kafka makes possible. We're already using message brokers to exchange events, but Kafka's ability to make that event stream persistent allows us to consider a new way of storing and exchanging data without losing out on our ability to CRE8 loosely coupled autonomous architectures. In this book, Ben talks about the idea of turning the database inside out, a concept that I suspect will get as many skeptical responses as I did back when I was suggesting moving away from giant shared databases. But after the last couple of years I've spent exploring these ideas with Ben, I can't help thinking that he and the other people working on these concepts and technology, and there is certainly lots of prior art here, really are onto something. I'm hopeful that the ideas outlined in this book are another step forward in how we think about sharing and exchanging data, helping us change how we build microservice architecture. The ideas may well seem odd at first, but stick with them. Ben is about to take you on a very interesting journey. Sam Newman